Hi, folks. Welcome to Lecture 3. Today we're going to cover staffing and international business. So what is staffing? I feel it's important that we understand that staffing actually is comprised of two very distinct activities. You have recruitment and selection. So recruitment is that process through which you identify a group of qualified candidates for open jobs. So basically, this is the process through which you, you gather a pool of qualified candidates from which to choose from. Selection, on the other hand, is the process of evaluating and hiring candidates from the recruitment pool. So again, recruitment is that process of, of, of gathering a pool of, of, of qualified candidates. Selection is that process of going through and choosing from those candidates and ultimately making a hire. So with international recruitment, there are several things that we need to look at, but the first question that you always need to answer is, are you looking for local applicants or foreigners who will be expatriated to the location? To the location. So obviously, depending on what your answer is, the strategy is going to be a lot different. Traditionally, firms have looked to employ locals for lower level type positions and home country expats for management and leadership roles. So the use of expats is absolutely a lot more costly, um, but there are some advantages. The individuals, uh, you know, generally they've been employed by you, so you have an understanding of what their capabilities are. You, they're, they're known quantities for you. Additionally, they know you, they know the organization, and therefore uh, are, are better able to kind of take and incorporate those elements into uh, a foreign entity. So, um, but one of the things that we've seen over the last decade or so is we've seen um, really a, a growth of kind of those middle level and senior manager folks or senior level folks so that we're not fully reliant on expats anymore the way that we have been previously. So where do we recruit? So the sources for Recruiting, be it local, uh, you know, foreign locals or expats that will be assigned elsewhere, really are the same places that we look anywhere else. So, you know, obviously we're looking for internal candidates first and foremost. Promotion, transfer, that would be my, my priority. Um, I always believe that you try to, to recruit at the lowest level possible. So if you have someone to fill those higher level positions, that's what you want to do. Advertising, uh, job posting sites, paid adverts, passive candidate sourcing, headhunting, whether through third party but preferably internally. So a good corporate recruiting function, in my opinion, should be able to have that uh, capability in their, their tool belt. Job fairs, uh, be it a city, profession, military, university type. Generally, job fairs are going to be restricted to either entry-level professionals, so college job fairs or um, more service-oriented, lower-skilled type of workers, be it hospitality, food service, things like that. Referrals from current employees are always good value. Um, certainly there are some downsides in that you tend to get a, a, a more homogenous group when you do that, because uh, people tend to, uh, to recruit people that look like them. So if you're in certain industries that are tend to be more predominantly white male, like a, a lot of the STEM industries, then you tend to recruit more white males through that and then other types of sources. So try to use them sparingly. Um, and then we get agencies. So agencies are third-party recruiters that go out and obviously hire on our behalf. Um, I try to use them very rarely, but there are certain instances, especially when you're looking at a high-level expat, uh, where there's certainly value in doing so. And finally, mergers and acquisitions. And mergers and acquisitions uh, pose an interesting thing. So, you know, as the labor force or the qualified labor force, particularly for professional type of, of organizations, uh, shrinks, what we're looking at is uh, we get lots of organizations that go out there and and they, they basically purchase other organizations if for no other reason than to acquire their staff, even more so than their portfolio. So how does international recruitment differ from 
U.S. recruitment. So some of the main differences that you're going to consider, the sources. So things like the job boards, where here we use Monster and Career Builder and LinkedIn and Indeed and, and so forth, each country is probably a little bit different. So you need to understand, do your research, figure out what are the sources, what are the job boards that are going to be the best fit for the country in which you're recruiting. Expats, a whole other issue. So you're going to go out and try to find out how do you connect with those expats. Um, probably not going to be through a job board. It's probably going to be through some passive candidate search or an agency. Languages, so you need to understand if you're dealing with languages other than English or whether than the, uh, other than the host country, then there's going to be some translation required, not just in terms of uh, the language and the job ads, um, but also all of your employment information, employment forms, all that kind of stuff. Legal language and ads, what's locally required. So just like here in the U.S., it's pretty standard that you'll see this, the, the EEO statement um, you know, in, in most job ads. You know, we do not discriminate on the basis of you know, sex, ethnicity, national origin, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to have to see what's out there and what's required of other countries, other countries in which you're recruiting for. And you have to remember that, you know, in certain countries, discrimination is not just permissible, but is actually required by law in some countries. So, for instance, in the Middle East, there are certain countries where women or certain ethnicities or certain religions are not able to hold particular positions. And so you're going to have to include that language in there. Math, method of advertisement, internet versus newspapers, etc. Remember, this kind of goes in with the sources. You have to understand where you're marketing, where you're really going out into. And so if you're recruiting in an area where uh, internet is still not widely acceptable uh, or available, then you're going to have to figure out how, how else can you get out there and reach those people, whether it's through newspapers, whether it's through job fairs, whether it's through what have you. Agency networks, understanding... Again, looking at agencies that have that expertise, either looking at expats or agencies local there on the ground. So, you know, I'm probably not going to hire or utilize an agent uh, in Denver to do my, re you know, to go and, and recruit 100 people in Ghana. And finally, demographic differences. You know, there are some, some substantial demographic differences um, as it relates to age. Um, in terms of the, the, you know, where the labor exists. And that's part of the drive of what we see going. And, and so, for instance, here is a look at the German demographic profile in 2015. And so you can see that it's, it's basically got the largest or, 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 or most substantial population in that range between, say, 45 and 55. Whereas... You look here at the Brazilian demographic profile, and this is pretty common for um, most of the developing countries, where they tend to be much, much heavier populations in the lower uh, things than what we see in the upper. So when we're looking for skilled labor, when we're looking for you know, that, the, the quantity, it's going to be these places where we're going to find it more so than there. So... That's part of the drive for international business, is looking out and realizing that we have a limited resource here, and so we're trying to find places where we can go, where we can find or have additional access to, to, to other resources that haven't previously been tapped. So integration with ATS, so an applicant tracking system is the system through which we manage all of our requisitions and, and all of our recruiting process. So this is the system that you go in, and when you're doing a, a search on LinkedIn or Monster, you're going to go in and, and apply for a job and fill it all out, and that system is then going to you know, push it up and have it reviewed and, and all that kind of stuff. So the challenges of, a, 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 of finding an ATS with a global, global capability is you know, considerable. So some of the things that you want to check – and, and consider when you're selecting an ATS, if you're an international company or planning to go international, is first you need to consider the languages. Does it have the capability of maintaining different languages? You need to think about format differences, so things like names and address. So 
you look at Hispanic cultures where they maintain both a maternal and paternal last name or, you know, addresses that uh, in, in many cases they don't follow a, kind of the U.S. model of uh, a street address, a city, a state, and a zip. Um, so you want to be able to make sure that there's the flexibility to be able to introduce that and, and, um, and change that around. Um, legal requirements by company, by country, you want to make sure that you have uh, the data that's required to be able to re be reported by country. Um, so here in the U.S., we have to, you know, do various reporting, uh, EEO1s, VETS100s, affirmative action uh, planning, and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so there are certain things that we should be maintaining, and that's the same as any other place. On top of that, there are other areas uh, where we're required to basically purge that data every now and then. So whereas the U.S. has no requirements that we purge the data ever, the U.K., for instance, makes you purge an employee's data basically at least every three years. So you can't keep any data in there more than 36 months. And um, so those are some requirements some challenges that you're going to need to set up. And then finally, the equivalency of experience in education, and this is always a challenge. Now for impacts, people that we're bringing from other places into the U.S., there's a process through which, you know, there are companies that will actually go through and they will uh, translate transcripts into U.S. equivalents to ensure that an individual with a, a bachelor's from, you know, Pakistan is equivalent to uh, the bachelor's here. So when we're dealing with local hires in international locations, generally we're not going to go through that whole process. Um, but over time you should learn kind of what are, what are those transferable or translatable uh, kind of pieces. So global employer branding. So branding is important, getting your name out there, making people understand and recognize it. So. How do you build a global reputation as an employer of choice? Um, certainly requires a lot more than cosmetic action. So it's a matter of really being able to uh, put out there and, and demonstrate the values of the organization. This requires close collaboration between the marketing team, external relations, and HR. There is a downside to having a strong brand, though. And uh, if you think of recruits as customers, you, you want to make sure that you attract the right customers. And so you want to be able to have a brand that's flexible. So in situations where you're, you know, doing a lot of M&A, and I'm in a position where I've done lots of M&A for my entire career um, on both sides. So I've acquired probably at least 15 businesses, and I've been part of two acquisitions where other companies have bought my company. And there, there's a challenge with branding and that sometimes that acquiring company doesn't have a stronger brand as what's already there. So when I was first acquired by Atkins, um, Atkins had a very small presence in the U.S. So we didn't have a brand recognition. It was a very immature brand, whereas in Britain, where it was based, it was the largest engineering firm there and widely known. And it had a 75-year-old, very prestigious branding. But here it was worth nothing. And on top of it, we had the, the Atkins diet, which we were competing in. So, you know, basically you had to go four Google pages down before you hit anything on Atkins engineering. Um, so understanding the differences and being able to localize that brand and have some segmentation is important in my opinion. You also need to focus on clarifying that employee value proposition. So, when we talk about what employer proposition is, it, you know, EVP is basically the give and the get. So, you know, an employee gives or pays a price to come to work. They work the long hours. They deal with the stress, the travel time away from home, effort, concentration, the basic blood, sweat, and tears of the work they do. And in return, they're getting their salary, their pension, um, hopefully good and interesting work and freedom and autonomy good culture and nice people that they like working with, recognition, growth and development opportunities and praise and recognition and appreciation. So it's a give and take. It's the balance between that give and get. 
So when we're looking at creating that element of employee value proposition, we're looking at different pieces that come into play. So the, the company itself, the values, the culture, the strong results and exciting challenges that come or that it can offer. Um, the rewards, you know, the financial indirect, indirect, uh, the, the nature of the work, career development, the freedom or the job itself, the freedom, the autonomy, the excitement of tasks and the jobs you do and the opportunity for growth and development. And then finally, leadership, you know, having good leadership that demonstrates integrity and provides a focus on people, provides a career development, and gives a boss that can be respected. Those are things that are critical and important to creating that EVP. All right, so having just gone through and, and looked at the recruiting side and how we, we developed that pool of, of qualified candidates, now we're gonna look at the selection side. So how do we select from a pool of candidates? And this is always gonna require some assessment of fit for the position, um, which would include an assessment of their knowledge, skills, and abilities, as well as a fit into the company culture. And in, in doing so, what we generally use would be some form of selection test or instrument to help make those judgments, help make those decisions. And these tests are you know, they vary by structure and standardization and performance measurement, but, you know, they add a lot of value. So the types of selection tests that we generally see, and we'll talk what these are, but we have the pre-screening, the interviews, which are the most common, different types of assessments like cognitive ability, personality, work sample, integrity testing, and then different types of background screening, such as criminal employment and education and drug screening. So resume pre-screening, this is the process that takes place by the recruiter. So what's generally happening here is that the recruiter is going through and assessing the qualification of a candidate for the position. So they're making sure that they have the minimum necessary requirements. So obviously in an international standpoint, that equivalency of education and experience is a challenge. Hopefully that's a learning piece. So they'll start to improve that, start to understand that. They can improve the quality of pre-screening by including different weighting and scoring criteria. One of the things that we do a lot of times, especially with ATS, is technology is advanced, will create or include what we would consider kill questions. So we look at some of the basic qualifications, say a degree or a certain type of experience or a certain number of years of experience, and we would do, you know, include yes, no questions do you have a degree in civil engineering or related fields, yes or no? Um, do you have experience in working on, you know, K through 12 education facilities, yes or no? And so if they say no, and those are requirements of the job, they're gonna automatically be removed consideration and we don't even have to pre-screen. They're just already, uh, already disqualified. So interviews, Interviews are most certainly the most common selection test used. Um, the effectiveness varies depending on the structured versus unstructured, behavioral versus behavioral or non-behavioral. So in looking at kind of the, the main dynamics that we look at, structured versus structured, unstructured. Structured deals with the extent to which there's a set series of questions that basically the hiring manager or the, the, the recruiter is going to ask of all the applicants. So it's consistent, so we can evaluate uh, truly against each other. Whereas the unstructured is basically there's no consistency, it's whatever questions come to mind. And certainly the, the validity and the reliability of the structured interview is far superior to the structured. So I always advise and I expect my managers to engage in a structured interview where they have a set questions list and they're going to go through those questions with everybody. Now, it doesn't mean they, they can't probe further. Certainly, we train them to do so, but we want the criteria to be consistent. Behavioral interviewing. So behavioral interviewing methods basically look at, at ways to, to include questions that really get to behavioral responses. And there are two types that we include here. We have traditional behavioral and situational. 
And traditional behavioral look at experience-based questions. So it'll be questions like, tell me about a time when you had a, you know, a dissatisfied customer. How did you solve that? Tell me about a time when you had a conflict with a coworker. How did you resolve that? So it's looking at an actual experience. Situational interview questions, on the other hand, look at a hypothetical. So here it's going to say, let's assume that you know this happened. How would you handle it? Let's assume that you have a conflict with your manager. How would you deal with it? So they both get a ways of, of, of looking at behavior of the individual as opposed to simple yes-no questions or something to that extent. And finally, multiple interviews and panels. Um, these, in my opinion, tend to get overused. Um, I think there's value in using panel interviews, using multiple interviews when you're looking at management or leadership roles, um, but more junior roles, I think it's a complete waste. But there is some great value in terms of getting uh, some, some interview process for some, some multiple interviewers looking at higher level folks so that they get um, some different perceptions and viewpoints of, of whether that person's a good fit. Assessments. So looking first at cognitive ability tests. So cognitive ability tests basically is another term for general intelligence tests. You can tend to think of it um, as IQ tests, which was a, is now an outdated term, but that's more or less the equivalent of what it is. And so the cognitive ability tests measure what we call the G factor for general intelligence. And it focuses on aptitude and understanding over learned knowledge. So it's not about, you know, being able to do a particular math problem or, or, or you know, knowing a list of vocabulary. But it, it tends to be more about being able to look and see or recognize patterns and puzzles and stuff like that. So overall, it is single best predictor of job performance. So it, it's, it's a very strong predictor of job performance across jobs. But there are certainly issues with use in international settings. So, you know, there are issues of, of its use with domestic settings in the form of adverse impact and uh, cultural variations that contribute to or that create that adverse impact. So those cultural variations exist in the international setting as well. So that's a consideration. Looking at the language and terminology used, especially when we're dealing with translation and how different words or terms are used is, is a big consideration. And finally, legal constraints. So certain countries actually restrict different kinds of tests. So you need to know what the law says in terms of whether you can or cannot use them. Assessments. Um, looking at personality assessment. So personality is not as strong a predictor of uh, performance as cognitive ability. Um, but there is some value to it. Um, so personality, by definition, is a consistent pattern of behavior over time, and some facets have been shown to be correlated with job performance either across jobs or specific types of work. So the, the most common occupational or job-based uh, personality design is, is the big five personality factors, and these consist of conscientiousness, emotional stability, extroversion and agreeableness uh, and openness to experience. So conscientiousness is of the five is the strongest predictor of performance and it's basically defined as, as more or less the dependability of the individual. So questions that get at this will ask things like, you know, I always pay my bills on time, I always fulfill my promises and I always make sure that I meet my commitments and stuff like that. So it, it, it is related to performance, but, you know, not really, really strong, but still some, some notable and significant enough to make it worth it. Emotional stability is also, emotional stability deals with the extent to which uh, an individual can cope with stresses and, and the challenges of the workplace. Extroversion is as it sounds, you know, that's, you know, individuals that are described as being gregarious and people, people, and, and all that. Um, you know, here, I, I, you know, I kind of 
take a, a different viewpoint or, 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 or try to specify what I define as introvert and extrovert. And to me, it's really about a comfort level. So often what we like to get into the stuff of, you know, people that are introverts are socially awkward and they're not comfortable in front of people. And, and it really isn't that because there are lots of extra, there are lots of introverts that are incredibly good and proficient in social context and, you know, whatever. To me, the definition I like to think of or the way I like to think about it is just in terms of, you know, given a scenario. So assume that you're at work and the entire day is just spent dealing with people. Call after call after meeting after meeting and it's just all day having to talk and converse and deal with people. So when you go home, what do you do? An introvert is going to sit on the couch and say, honey, you know what? I had a tough day. I just want to sit here. I don't want to talk about it. I just want to be quiet and watch a little TV. So they want to escape a little bit back into themselves. An extrovert, on the other hand, is going to come home and say, honey, I had a rough day. Let's go out. And so that's where I kind of make that distinction. It's really what the preferences and how they all work together. So, you know, it's, um, it's not about who is, you know, capable or incapable. It's just about preferences. Now, there are certain things that extroverts have been shown to be stronger at, certainly sales positions and stuff like that, which makes sense. They're more able to get out there, more comfortable with making small talk, with doing the chit chat and being able to to ingratiate themselves with customers. So so there's a, a value there. Agreeableness deals with the extent to which you are agreeable, uh, meaning you get along with others, shown to be not related with performance overall. And openness to experience is your openness to try new things, to look at different ways of doing things. And uh, again, not necessarily uh, related with uh, performance outcomes. So it's a mixed bag. There are some that show some good, uh, some value in predicting performance and others that do not. So some of the consider considerations uh, for use in international companies, there's no adverse impact that exists with personality tests, but there is variability in some of the traits uh, again, across cultures that may reduce its usefulness. Um, further, there is just insufficient cross-cultural research to really be able to generalize outside of Western cultures. <laughs> work sample tests. The work sample tests are good. They actually are uh, performance tests of the actual job or what's going to be required of them on the actual job. And um, so these are, are good validity. Um, so they, you know, they do a great job, but they're extremely hard and costly and difficult to develop and administer. So think about it from the standpoint of, you know, if you've got a large organization with 300 jobs within the U.S., each of those jobs, it's not likely you're going to develop a, uh, a work sample test for each of those 300 jobs. So we tend to use it quite sparingly, and it tends to be for very specific high volume type of jobs. Um, certainly in the international context, language issues are a concern, so you want to make sure uh, that translation is, is uh, done well. Integrity tests, effective in identifying certain elements that are likely to steal and be dishonest, relies heavily on concept of social desirability, concept that is not standard across cultures, which creates a problem. So like personality, cross-cultural research is still not that developed. Um, so not, a real clear, not real clear as to how it functions outside of non-Western countries. Background screen. Uh, legalities of background screen vary significantly among countries. Uh, for instance, Canada doesn't allow uh, certain types of background screening. So many countries lack infrastructure to support even basic background screening. So a lot of times whether it's just that it's run on paper and they don't have digital records, a lot of times you won't be able to really be able to verify prior work history, uh, education history, criminal background, all that. So in a lot of cases, that you just can't get it to begin with. So further, you need to understand the legal limitations and requirements 
uh, in the event that an offer is rescinded, i.e., uh, an adverse action as a result of the outcome. Here in the U.S., you know, there's a process through the FCRA which we are required to go through, and there should be comparable processes in other countries. And then finally, the drug screening uh, is even a, a bit more precarious than, than just traditional background check of looking at, you know, work history, education, and, and criminal. So, you know, many countries like Canada actually make it more or less illegal to do drug screens as a condition of employment. So you need to understand what the requirements are in different areas. So selection and diversity management. So what selection practices would heighten discrimination and decrease diversity? Secrecy and confidentiality around uh, selection. We want there to be transparency as much as possible. Absence of clear selection practices, a subtle and informal culture, and nominations for appointments by headquarters or senior management rather than individuals that are more closely related or linked uh, to the positions at hand. <laughs> So what does diversity mean? So we're not just talking about, you know, the gender and the race, ethnic background, but we're talking about sexual orientation, age, nationality, educational background. So we're looking at not just the demographic diversity, but uh, elements of diversity as it relates to experience and, and everything else. So what types of initiatives can promote diversity? Identification of uh, high potential among minority groups, recruitment targets, targets for high potentials, uh, recruiters that are from minority groups or in the case of international uh, recruiting that are actually local to the areas from which you're recruiting, policies favoring the preferences of targeted groups, networking and mentoring programs, uh, the measurement of inclusiveness. So, you know, the concept of inclusiveness of has increasingly kind of uh, taken over diversity, and that it's not just enough to to express and to um, to accept or to tolerate differences, but to you know the real goal is to include to make them feel like they're part of that total fabric. So should the diversity strategy be global or local or mixed? And really, it needs to be both. You know, you really need to have uh, a local focus on minority, but it needs to be uh, a value that is globally adopted. All right. So that comes to or brings us to an end on uh, that. And... Um, let me get my code word here. So the code word for today is the band Warrant, uh, which is an awesome band if you've never heard of them. So certainly uh, check them out and uh, I think you'll like them. So again, Warrant and um, have a good one. Thanks, guys. <laughs>